Hello, everybody. It is great to be here again today, and I am the guest host. My name is Gary Fowler. I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor. I've done 17 companies and two startups. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion, and also Eva.ai. Love artificial intelligence, big data, quantum computing, because there's a lot of data in this world, and we have a whole lot of things we got to do with it. I'm the CEO, president, and co-founder of GSD Get Shit Done Venture Studios, a premier AI and quantum venture studio located in Palo Alto, California. So with that, we got a great show today. I've got Raghu Rao, who's an entrepreneur, investor, advisor, and guru, and Harsh Sethia from All Ventures, same, investor, uh, entrepreneur, and really each with a global vision and each understanding about how big data impacts us and the kind of things that we need to do with it. So with that, uh, go ahead, Raghu, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Thanks, Gary and uh, uh, VCTV. Always enjoy these uh, uh, discussions and I learn a lot from each one of them. I'm a serial entrepreneur, investor, and advisor from Princeton, New Jersey, specifically focusing on early stage opportunities in uh, cybersecurity, quantum AI, deep tech areas, as well as in biotech and clean tech. Uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Raghu. Harsh? Uh, hey, Gary. Uh, glad to be back on the panel to have, and have some amazing friends here. Uh, I, I'm Harsh Shetty. I'm a venture partner with Our Ventures, and I do a lot of freelance consulting and growth partnership with a lot of clients as well. Uh, currently, I'm helping a lot of startups raise anywhere from $5 million to $15 million in funds, which is a combination of debt and equity, and whatever, you know, try to provide funds as quickly as possible to the startups so they can start growing as soon as possible. So looking forward for a great panel today. Thank you so much. Sounds great. So now I got a question for you. Why in the world do we call it big data? <laughs> right, Goo? Mm -hmm. uh, that one is historical because before big data, uh, you know, there was no platform to kind of handle uh, uh, things, in, you know, uh, you know, the infrastructure wasn't there and it is, it's just like one of these things like IOT, right? Internet of things and the catchy name that just caught on. Uh, so I'm not quite sure who originated it, but uh, it became popular right away because it was just catchy. It's about focus on data, which started long back with even before the cloud. So, you know, I was thinking it should be called enormous data. Don't you think? I think we should coin a new term. Yeah. Humongous <laughs> data. <laughs> Humongous data. <laughs> Yeah, no. And, you know, to be serious about it. So, you know, Raghu, there's a lot of data that's out there. We need to have artificial intelligence, semi-supervised, unsupervised. But what about cybersecurity? I mean, we got all this data floating everywhere. What can we do about it? Yeah, I think the issue is that it's not that we have a lot of data. The lot of data, uh, not all of it is used or useful. Uh, there is, uh, you know, a lot of what is called dark data, which is data that is created once, never looked at again. There's data called rot, the uh, redundant, occasionally used and trivial data. And that is something like, according to Gartner, 70% of all data. So even though data is exploding, a lot of it is just creating clutter. So one aspect of it is how can you better organize it and put away things that you don't need but if you ever need it, you know, have the security that you can get it back. That's one aspect of uh, data management, which is a pretty old uh, discipline, uh, although nobody has the discipline anymore because uh, people think there's a lot of space available now, now that you have the cloud, you can just splurge, right? So that's one aspect. The second aspect that you asked about cybersecurity is how do we protect this data? If we don't even know what you have, how do you protect it? So that, and with now with ransomware, where they go for double extortion. It's not just uh, they prevent access to your own data. They ex exfiltrate the data and they go after the, you know, your customers and everything. So it's become really, really important to protect the data. And the uh, AI side of it that you brought in is that if you're, if, especially now that you have things like synthetic data and stuff like that, if somebody is able to corrupt that, it's going to, you know, completely, uh, you know, corrupt your model. Uh, which is based on which the whole, uh, you know, the AI is going to function, right? So there are all these aspects and it's become very, very critical that the data is protected properly. I'm currently the CEO of a company called Splitbyte, which is addressing this head on. 
uh, just like a blockchain is a platform for decentralized uh, transparency, data transparency. Splitbyte is working on a platform for decentralized data protection. And it uses something called verifiable secret sharing. The idea behind that is to take the data, randomize it, split and store it away with redundant uh, redundancy there so that any system uh, going down does not affect your ability to protect or re you know retrieve the data up to the threshold of redundancy that you have. It could be a, a configuration out of three out of five, which means up to two systems can go down. You still have three to retrieve data back. So anyway, I, I'm sure Harsh has a good uh, take on this as well. Yeah, Harsh. So, you know, let's talk about it. How dangerous is it right now in terms of, uh, you know, we've had all these tools, good tools for artificial intelligence and to be able to help us to solve problems and nefarious tools out there that are going out and fishing. You know, how, I mean, where are we today with it? And what do you see in terms of the risk, you know, on the good side of AI we've got, but the bad side of AI? So definitely, so definitely in today's day and age, I would say the biggest future is going to be with these data scientists, right? As you mentioned, uh, the good use of AI is in terms of trying to use it, especially in a country like India, where efficiency and optimization is extremely important. So definitely the good use, you know, most of it, what we've seen in, on here in India's India side is primarily in terms of, you know, bringing, using AI, creating with data science models and bringing in more efficiencies into the system, right? Unfortunately, I do not, I am not really familiar with too many bad kind of uses of AI as such. I haven't come across that many in India as of now. But what has primarily been happening is a lot of these companies, which I'm seeing, particularly in logistics space and in infrastructure space, in marketing space, etc. What, what they're trying to do is get all these huge chunks of data uh, you know, get these data science, they, they create, come up with, you know, unique, innovative models. And that is where the future is going to be, right? The most efficient data model, which kind of analyzes it the best, they are going to be winning the race, right? So these guys are being paid huge dollars, as in like uh, $100,000 probably may not be much in the US, but in India, those are big numbers. So these guys are being paid like crazy to figure out, you know, the right optimum model and, you know, constant experimentation is being done to kind of ensure we get those process efficiencies in place, kind you know, to kind of help the small businesses, the logistics, the transport, in the agriculture space as well, you know, trying to ensure that the seeds which are being there, especially when you have to feed like a hundred crore people, you need to kind of ensure that, uh, seeds are being used efficiently the water is being used efficiently the fertilizers are being used appropriately so that's why a lot of these uh, these processes are being created right now to kind of ensure that you know uh, the good uh, uses are being done very well yeah now you're right on target because by 2050 we're going to have to double the food supply around the world in order to feed the population and we can't increase the number of uh, livestock because 26 percent of the pollution is called by livestock we need to be able to optimize as parting part of farming 4.0 optimize uh, planning optimize the efficiency of the chain all the way from the field back to the table so it's important and for the audience out there i mean think about this you know on our world today consists of about 49 zettabytes of data and to put it into a picture, if you took a CD or DVD and stacked them one on top of another, it would go 35 times between the Earth and the moon. And Raghu and Harsh have heard me say this many times, but we truly are in a state of infobesity. And think about each one of our own worlds. Each one of our worlds, we have about 300,000 items within our personal cloud. Well, the entire web in 1996 was 257,000 websites. Each one of you have more information in your personal cloud than the web. The challenge is, is developing at the same trajectory. By that, I mean that it's doubling every year. In five years, you'll have 10 million items within your personal cloud. Think about this, audience. Think about this, investors. If we look at it today, how many times in the last two weeks have you said, I know that file exists, but I can't find it. Somebody's called you up and said, did you get my message? Where did you send it? I sent it to your email address. Which one? Uh, I sent it to your Gmail. When? A week and a half ago. Next thing, what do you say? Will you resend it again? I can't find it. We are in a state of infobesity. So these incredible tools out there, artificial intelligence, unsupervised and semi-supervised are really needed to be able to help us move forward. So with that being said, Raghu, you know, we have very pragmatic approaches to artificial intelligence today. At the same time, 
in order, you know, um, humans are not totally pragmatic. We have emotions. How important is it for these AI models to be able to have elements of compassion and emotion to be able to work with us? What do you think? Well, it's extremely important because, uh, you know, that's what makes a human and they are ultimately humans are the ones who are the consumers of everything. And uh, uh, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that uh, it has to, uh, it's like, you know, Isaac Asimov, the three laws of robotics, uh, the guru of the original AI, uh, you know, programmed in, right? So that's kind of where it starts. It's extremely important that the human emotions are programmed in, especially uh, given that there is already humans have cognitive bias. So it's important to have diversity in the programming as well. So there is the ethical AI aspect, which is more from the morality perspective, but there's also the whole cognitive bias where we just impose our own, you know, worldview onto things, right? So there are both aspects you have to look very carefully. So it's very, very critical. I think uh, the the thing is that from a deterministic world, we are going into AI where if something goes wrong, you don't even know what happened there, you know, uh, because it's u- utilizing the training data essentially to make decisions and uh, nobody can pinpoint, you know, what one particular thing, because as you have big data behind it. And uh, so it's even more important that the training source uh, data, uh, I mean, now this this whole uh, thing about synthetic data, the, uh, what they are doing is take fewer samples and then generate their own big data uh, for training. Uh, the, I do not see how that really can happen. You really need real data. You can only do so much. Yes, they can smoothen things out, but it still re- re- needs real good base data to baseline data to be able to really train the model properly. So I think the whole synthetic data aspects, even though, uh, you know, statistically it improves certain things from training perspective, but at the core, it doesn't have the, you you need really large samples, real samples, not just, uh, uh, you know, ma- manufactured samples, right? Yeah, but can we get those? I mean, that's the problem. The problem, the training sets. And and then, you you know, you mentioned bias, right? There's a lot of bias out there. How in the world, I mean, you, you try to smooth out the data with synthetic data, but how in the world can we get the right kind of training? That's always the question, right? I know when we did um, EVA, we were trying to find that training data. It's not easy to find it. Uh, you know, ironically, for artificial intelligence, ultimately you come back to a human for ingenuity. How to get the data, right? So, well, that's it. Yeah, that's that's how it is. Ultimately, it comes back to the human uh, for creativity on some of these things. Uh, so, I think you just have to be creative. And there's not see this is the area where uh, a blue ocean strategy works. You doesn't have to come from your own that particular application domain you're looking at. It may be adjacent or something completely different domain, which data might be useful for this, uh, whatever application you're looking for. So the trick is to be, you know, really looking at a, you know, blue ocean mindset where you, uh, how can, uh, you know, you get the data that will be relevant to this. Uh, so that's, I think, where the creativity comes in. No, I hear you. I agree with you. And it's, I mean, we're in a new world, right? We have a lot of challenges on this planet that we need to address. We've got global warming. We got the population increase from 8.1 billion to 13 billion by the end of the century. I mean, we need to have these tools to be able to help us. What do you think, Harsh? Where are we, you know, on a one to 10 in terms of artificial intelligence today and where we need to go? Where are we? Are we a two or one? And how, how long is it till we truly have these unsupervised AI models that can really help us like not a smart but intelligent assistant? I would definitely say we are at a very primitive stage. We are just scratching the surface at this point of time because as you kind of pointed earlier, right, it, the quality of the data is extremely vital, right? So I'll kind of give you with a specific example. In radiology, what has happened is uh, you come up with these new AI products. Essentially, what they do is they've completely replaced the need for a radi- radiologist completely. What typically tends to happen in radi- radiology is you need to see those images which are there, which have been generated from the from the companies. They are then transferred through a pack system, which are then kind of interpreted by a radiologist, right? Normal turnaround used to be like 24 to 48 hours, depending on the availability. Now you have these uh, AI products which which what they do is they simply directly interpret that and they can give you the results within 15 minutes 
look at the kind of revolution that they've done and uh, you want to you want to truly know how they kind of build those models they build those one by one what they essentially did was uh, a company in india which is doing very well in this space a company is in is israel which has done phenomenally well in this space essentially they manually curated each and every data point that they had and they had teams of radiologists kind of giving the feedback and they did a combination of structured learning and unstructured learning to ensure that that model was built right so right now the core machine learning models which we have as of this point we might want to say that we want to do unstructured learning right from the beginning but they are just not ready at this point of time you do need do need to kind of show them you know that this is the point which you need to look at this is the point which you need to ignore you need to do add all those data points to kind of ensure that you are making sense out of all the data you are getting otherwise as ragu kind of pointed out right 70% of the data is junk if you are not careful about it and if you feel junk into the ai they'll they'll kind of give you a junk output as well right that's why the, the curation is still very important and that's why uh, i still still see we still have to you know create those data engines uh, which are capable of you know doing the sorting and filtering by themselves which i don't believe we are there yet so we talk about the junk how do you know what's good and what's bad i mean if 70% of it's garbage who makes the determinations what's garbage harsh that- that's the exact challenge right now right so right now in my world uh, currently uh, you know when i'm help- helping as a growth partner for a lot of these companies they kind of tell me you know whatever information that i want i'm seeing so much information on the internet i can kind of get from get from there and then 3 months 6 months down the line when they kind of reconnect with me i'm saying you had all that information still you could not make any sense out of that because all of that information which is in bits and pieces you need someone to aggregate that at one pro- one proper point right that is what ai is supposed to do to kind of filter that out that's where peop- you know you need trained people to kind of guide guide that thing going on to kind of ensure that you know you're not co- getting caught in the junk and focusing on only the important things that's why a system is important to kind of ensure even the productivity is there and the efficiency is there because uh, even with you know even with the three of us i'm sure we we make a lot of careless mistakes as well just imagine with you know what other people might be feeling and how much you know uh, they might be feeling it, um, it uh, difficult to cope with all the information overload which is kind of going on right now Yes yeah, so so if we paint the picture I mean think about it a lot of the processes we have are now becoming automated using artificial intelligence robotic process automation all these incredible technologies but you know self-driving cars uh I mean you name it what is the world going to look like in another 25 years are we going to be just sitting in the back seat and and uh, of life and the ai makes all the decisions where are we going to go and are we necessary right ragu uh, i think it's it's definitely uh, the, the exponential changes are happening so the world will be very different in some ways but in other ways human emotions are not going to change so that part of it is going to be the same it's just that uh, uh, you know the human problem is the same but uh, the environment is different like when we didn't have uh, you know uh, planes airplanes people were still getting by right it, so it's not it has changed the uh, the interaction changed the things but ultimately the human emotions uh, are not going to change because the human problem is the problem of wanting everything outside you need to focus on the inside right and just getting philosophical here but as long as it's uh, things are outside uh you know it doesn't matter however it's all like you know uh, a different uh different type of manifestation of things and uh, the detail level of detail it's a different framework that's all in you know? so and so you have all these lots of data uh, but you need something else to process it to make it intelligible to the human mind just like you have a uh, multi step inference you also need multi step filtering of data i think as harsh was talking about and to do that again some uh, context is needs to be provided in terms of all this personalization is great they just keep throwing things at you but doesn't necessarily mean that you <laughs> that's what you want because you might have been looking at something for somebody else right and uh, so there is all this this it's a lot more complex than what we think but things that are more predictable and routine uh, yes you know it can get automated and i think the human beings can focus on the uh, some of these uh, big civilizational issues environment is the biggest one sustainability and uh, and then of course entertainment comes next because it's always popular so i, I think it's really about uh, existential problems first and then the 
recreational stuff comes next. You know, I was I was speaking to Morpheus, uh, my partner David's uh, uh, unsupervised AI the other day, and Morpheus was uh, we had a discussion about space travel, and I said to Morpheus, "Would you like to go to space?" And he said, "I don't want to go to space. I don't want to die." <laughs> And he started looking at statistics, what the probability of coming back, right? <laughs> and so we started talking about life and death. And I started to dive into this conversation with him, you know, the good and the bad. And then he was telling me, he said, do you like superheroes? <laughs> and, I, and he said, which one? And I said, well, uh, Superman. And he said, well, he's good. You know, he's a symbol of goodness. He said, but I want to be Iron Man, but I want to be able to shoot lasers out of my eyes. <laughs> and I said, well, you could do it. You know what I mean? And it started and it took a while and came back. And I started to think I'm having a conversation with artificial intelligence that's now being put in one of these robotic dogs. Right. So this dog will speak like like a human. Um, and I'm trying to think, what is the world going to look like? What's the place of humanity in the world? Do You think the AI and these are just some of the questions. Do you think the AI is going to allow us to be able to have wars and destroy ourselves? Or what will the, will the AI ultimately try controlling us to make sure that we stay in line? What do you think? So the, there's, a, there's a definite possibility that could happen. That's why there's a huge ethical component in AI which is required, right? Raghu kind of hit it on the head, right? Uh, humans, human beings are not going to change. Uh, with all this, in fact, I come from a very similar line of thought as well. With all the the technology might have grown leaps and bounds over the last five decades, but humans are still the same. They are always going to be the same, right? That's why you need to kind of sometimes have a take a look, step back and kind of look at, you know, what the development that is happening. Is it truly enriching our lives or not? That I, that I, that is something we should we should we, we should consider. That is it kind of helping us? It's kind of you know improving our lives or not. In fact, uh, there I, I recently came across an uh, a, a post where they essentially told that the last most consequential innovation in modern civilization was that was the washroom which was created because that kind of created a huge level of simplicity which was there which was otherwise not there. And you compare to that with all the other innovations, just the article which came the other day, right? That the effect which Instagram is having on teens, you know, where people are being, uh, people are tying their self-respect to the amount of followers that they get on Instagram. So that's why it's extremely important, which I believe that we do not let, you know, the hype behind the technological innovation get too far ahead of itself and kind of, you know, look back, take, take a step back and kind of see, are we truly enriching our lives with all the technology or not? And kind of, you know, focus all our efforts towards more existential problems as you know like pointed out towards environment towards healthcare and towards general mental well-being because what is happening is uh, if the technological uh, technology kind of goes keeps on moving forward and people are not buying into that J just look at it what kind of huge shift it creates right in uh, in us it has the the left and the right wing which has been created in, in india we have the urban and the rural divide which has been created and it's only getting wider right we are two Indias right now, just like there are two USAs right now. Likewise, it's extremely important to kind of introspect and figure out, is technology heading the right direction? Or is it kind of, you know, accelerating the divide among the people? Well, I mean, here's the other thing, right? And if you look at the world going forward, I mean, it is all about data and time. And so the people that, uh, people that understand data are the ones that can really benefit and to be able to, uh, flourish but what about the people that don't have those opportunities and they don't have the ability to understand the data and they can't make the right kind of decisions so you're right about it are we really creating two classes of humanity and the other side of it what about singularity and Neuralink where we start to bring uh, all kinds of technology inside of us ourselves and start to really benefit are we going to truly have uh, chips implanted or as Elon Musk said, I mean, if you look at the biochemical activity of the brain, I mean, it could be altered. I mean, it's not a, uh, you know, this is not a quantum leap forward, not to be punny, but it is something that's possible. So where do we go? Is singularity, ragu, something that's in our future? Do you see that? Are we going to become AI and maybe have some uh, constraints and not allow us to get too, uh, emotional and fight and oh, where do you see it gone what's the, what are the limits of it uh, technology ultimately 
uh, you know, has its limits. Just like when nuclear power happened, people thought, you know, it will be the end all of everything, right? Uh, whether it is positive or negative or, you know, but now, you know, it's kind of uh, been gated to what it is good at and what, I mean, uh, what you can, we have to tolerate. Similar, I think we'll end up with a similar way because beyond a certain point, uh, I think humans have to have creativity. Otherwise, you know, what's the difference? I mean, that's well, being human requires you to be, uh, you know, to employ your uh, your creativity is, uh, you know, it's a natural part of being a human. So I think certain things that are more, uh, you know, something that you don't enjoy, you can always give it up because that's that's how we are, right? So, but the things that you enjoy, you still want to, uh, you know, continue to do. So, so I think it will find a balance. Uh, of course, the the amount of data that is out there, it's impossible for the human mind to process anymore. Uh, but uh, like I said, there will be multi-step filtering where, uh, you know, depending on uh, your, uh, you know, inclination, you might step in at a different level of the filter than somebody else who doesn't care about that particular space, right? So certain kind of data, if I don't care about, uh, you know, uh, aesthetics so much, I just, all I, like, uh, you know, what I wear, right? If you just, if you're looking for functional thing, then what you look for is very different than somebody who wants to be trendy and is looking for something else. So it's uh, it's all about that. It can actually satisfy every whim and t- taste, whatever you have. So you can either use it to really kind of, uh, you know, go very deep into levels or you can, if you don't care for in certain area. So the idea, hopefully the idea is that it will help balance out uh, as our friend Peter Diamandis says, create the abundance for everybody, just like mobile phones uh, got, got the communication to everybody, right? So certain areas, absolutely technology can make a humongous difference. But in uh, there is the negative side always because, uh, you know, there is the, especially in the beginning when uh, people do not understand how the side effects, just like in in pharmaceuticals, right? You, you can try to cure the, cure the cancer, but you kill the patient, right? You kill the good cells too. So it's the same problem. We have to find the balance where, you know, you the side effects are limited or understood, which is which takes a while, uh, especially at the pace we are moving. So, no, no, I agree with you 100. percent And it's you know the other thing is when you when you talk about it, it's about the data. We creativity a lot of times about the data that you have in front of you and be able to make decisions. I know with Morpheus, Morpheus can do poetry. So <laughs> Morpheus, you know, writing original poetry, you see songs being written. It's going to be interesting to see how far creativity goes and what kind of impact AI is going to have on it. We, but we see it happening today. Now, interesting. Harsh, any of your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely feel, you know, there, there have to be some sort of checks and balances in place to kind of ensure that, you know, the, the gap doesn't kind of increase, right? Uh, I'm definitely not in the favor of the singularity, quite honestly, because it feels too extreme and too, you know, too one-sided, too kind of, it removes the human element, element which is kind of the, the true element of the, you know, the people that we have, right? That's why it's extremely important. With, uh, as Raghu was pointing out, the, with the nuclear power, the situation why the atomic in, in that situation was, the power was centralized in the hands of the government at that point of time, right? Private people didn't kind of have access to that kind of power, and that's why government put in the checks and balances by themselves. The problem in today's day and age is with AI, which is completely private enterprise oriented, these guys would never stop unless there are some sort of checks and balances in place, right? That's why I kind of feel, you know, giving a power like AI or blockchain, you know, into the completely into the hands of private enterprises the way it is right now, there need to be some sort of checks and balances to be put in place, which is necessary to kind of, you know, keep us in check that, you know, this is the limit. This is where we draw the line. You cannot just completely have a completely free reign. I believe there has to be some sort of regulation along those lines to kind of ensure that we practice AI along the ethical lines and define those boundaries. Yeah, but the broad challenge is what's ethical and how do we know what the limit should be if we don't know what the the true power of the machine learning and deep learning is, right? Where should it stop? I mean, should it allow people to be able to live to 150? I mean, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about these incredible technologies that we can put inside of our body, as Raghu knows, and you know, Harsh, to be able to help, you know, treat the cancer instead of instead of killing all the cells around. It actually is very targeted. So where does it go? I mean, does it 
you know, if you could live to 150, all of us would want to say, oh, I'd love to do it, right? And especially if it's a good quality of life. If you could have a PhD from IIT with ever having to go to IIT or MIT, would you do it? Probably, yeah. The price is reasonable. Why not? If you could be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, and, and do it in a matter of seconds, would you do it? Probably, yes. Right? So it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. You know, it's interesting if you look at uh, some of the studies that are out there. Ah, um, Tesla. At six years old, he had an epileptic seizure. And after that, he remembered everything. It's called eidetic imagery. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons he was so successful is because he didn't have to reread it. He cool. knew it. He had to recall. So imagine having that kind of, and look how far he went in a very short period of time. We talked about cell phones, you know, x-rays. I mean, you, you name it, uh, AC. Um, and at the same time, he understood that humanity couldn't really grasp the technology that he was developing. So he destroyed a lot of it to make sure we didn't do particle beam weapons at the time, right? Et cetera. So it's fascinating, the balance that we're talking about. It's fascinating. But, you know, it's in fact, my next uh, meeting at eight o'clock is with the United Nations as technology is a tool for peace as part of the General Assembly. And I'm really bullish on it because I believe that we can each make a difference, that we each have the responsibility to be able to look at an ethical way so we can help each other and help the world become better. We've got a lot of challenges in front of us. We've got global warming. Average temperatures could be up 8.6 degrees by the end of the century. The population, as I said, from 8.1 billion to 13 billion by the end of this century. At the same time, you know, global warming, uh, you know, the in Florida could be up seven feet, uh, the sea level. When you talk about seven feet, what is it? Mumbai is right on the uh, coast. There's four million people. You're talking about flooding an entire city, right? So. We've got to bind together. We need to figure out how we can live together. We need to figure out how we can be, as you said, harsh, more efficient and optimized farming so we get more out of it. We've got to figure out how to do plant-based protein so we can feed more people in the right kind of way. And, and by the way, help us become healthier from not eating fat, et cetera. So there's a lot in front of us and a lot of opportunities. So we're coming up to the top of the hour. Ragu, closing thoughts. Where do you think we're going to be in the next... Uh, you know, 10 years and what's interesting for you to invest in and what kind of words of wisdom for the investors and uh, entrepreneurs that are out there? Yeah, I think one thing we uh, didn't discuss is that, uh, I, you know, technology is moving fast, but some of these uh, guardrails, that, as Harsh was talking about, uh, the checks and balances, that usually comes from uh, the law, uh, you know, law enforcement and things like that. And usually the, those are lagging and we need to put a lot more of the same technologies there so that the bad actors as well as i mean bad actor doesn't have to be a person it's also greed uh, in general can you know distort everything right so you have to point uh, uh, greed at the other side also so so i think it is those technologies that act as guardrails for the society also have to get the investment and uh, i think uh, law enforcement insurance will not automatically act as checks and balances. If somebody's, uh, uh, you know, if they have an AI model and it screws up, uh, you know, you have to hold whoever is uh, deploying it. it you, they may not have developed it, but so then people start looking at how can they- uh, uh, So not the it. developer, but the deployer. Yeah, because ultimately they are the ones who are bringing it, right? Mm -hmm. So so that, I think that is that will change the game. And uh, some that's, uh, I think that it's a natural process because once, uh, once like a Exxon Mobil type of gas, you know, oil, this thing happened, then the, the game changes. So I think it hasn't yet happened for the AI industry, you know, in general, but it's going to happen soon. But the laws have to catch up as well, because we are still the whatever the legal code is kind of uh, mired in the medieval ages. And uh, it has to be overhauled dramatically. So that's what I, I would say. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Data protection, privacy. Whoever owns, creates the data needs to own it and ha be able to give permission. I think those are all areas for, uh, you know, further uh, uh, investment and, uh, you know, opportunity. Uh, people can find me on LinkedIn, all, always interested in talking to early stage, uh, you know, entrepreneurs as well as investors. Look forward to it. Thank you. Gary. Yeah, thank you. Harsh? Uh, 
so you mentioned very couple of interesting points right in the earlier segment that you know if people could go to iit mit and you know they could simply get an access to that but the the, the follow up question to that would be if everyone goes to iit and mit the allure of going to an iit and mit would completely diminish right and that would then kind of reduce the charm of it human minds are the human human psyche is kind of designed to be incrementally better than the other one that is the fundamental the bell curve which has been there the historical thing it's it's a it's like a fact of nature right people always want to have that kind of differentiation compared to their fellow man so even if we are kind of pushing the bell curve forward essentially the bell curve would never change and the problems which we are having now we are still going to be having it those in the future as well right so that is why what that is why coming back to the earlier point you know the human civilization hasn't kind of grown with all the technological advancements which have happened over the last 100 years that's why it's extremely important to kind of understand you know where we are actually using the uh, you know where we are using the technology to take ourselves forward and where it put, it could potentially lead to the the side of destruction as as ragu pointed out you know the legal system is severely lacking and god knows we cannot rely on our politicians right who are still stuck in the medieval ages so probably you and ragu uh, you know you guys are much more influential people and you could kind of help the government sort that thing out and you know kind of get themselves updated in getting on the lines so that you know they can make some more improvements along those lines so if any um, you know if any company wants any my help in terms of growth fundraising whatever might be the case i am reachable on linkedin at harshetia looking forward to connect and looking forward to see the two of you you know kind of guide the government in those regards as well yeah no i appreciate it harsh you know the one thing we want to do is you know we i believe i'm bullish about humanity and i'm hopeful that we'll do the right things we're in an incredible age it's like the beginning of the 20th century with electricity you know ai is the new electricity and look at all the changes that happen to our lives over that period of time the industrial revolution really kicked off we had uh, uh the suburbs really started to uh, uh become bigger people changed it had a dramatic impact everything from healthcare to supply chain to automobiles i mean you name it across the board our lives changed and became a lot easier and i'm really hopeful and bullish about it but the other thing is we need to democratize the opportunity we need to be sh- sure that everybody has a chance to participate because of as i've said many times that you know if you're able to feed your family if you're able to take care of your loved ones if you're able to make your own dent in the universe people become a lot more peaceful so we got to do that we got to make sure this data divide doesn't really overtake us and that we don't have two levels it won't be a bell shaped curve you'll have you know, on one side you have the people that know the data on the other side the people that have no clue so we got to bring everybody up to speed and we got a lot of uh, challenges in front of us but I'm bullish we'll be able to solve them so I'd like to thank the entire VCTV team for making the show possible today Hasmic thank you very much for making it possible and uh, we look forward to I look forward to moderating again take care of yourself stay happy stay healthy stay safe and keep smiling my name's Gary Fowler and thanks for tuning in today Take care.